start arguing about a theological point, uh, there would be probably no end to the argument. But if you tell a person experience, nobody will argue with you. This, you say, I experienced this, this happened to me. Nobody will argue with you when you relate a personal experience. The Holy Spirit is, power, is a power that surges through our lives and makes us courageous, daring witnesses. Have you heard of a man called Roland Stewart? This fellow was an alcoholic. He was drunk almost every day of the week. Seldom was he sober. But then Jesus healed him of his alcoholism and he wanted to witness for thousands of people. So he prayed and said, Lord, show me a way to share my faith with thousands of fellow Americans. And the Holy Spirit, he says, gave him an idea. What was his idea? To buy tickets to all major sporting events. So he and his wife Margaret every year travel or drive 55,000 miles. They go from city to city, from state to state where major athletic uh, events take place and they buy tickets. When they enter the stadium, they unfurl their banner. And they have a large banner which they unfurl and the banner says John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he and his wife keep that banner unfurled throughout the game. From the beginning of the game until the end. So all the people in the stadium see John 3.16 and read it. And not only that, every major athletic competition is televised. So people watching the game on their television would see that banner and read what's on it. That's how they shared their faith with thousands. They live a very Spartan life. And they have a beaten up old van which they use for travel pur traveling purposes, but they're happy because they're witnessing for their faith. They're witnessing for their Lord. And he says, Roland Stewart says, the Holy Spirit gave him the idea. The Holy Spirit works in marvelous ways, doesn't he? When the miracle of Pentecost happened, when the 120 disciples of Jesus were assembled in the upper room received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Peter stood up and preached a mighty sermon. Remember, this was the Peter who had denied knowing Christ. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter denied that he had ever known Christ. A slave girl recognized Peter to be one of Jesus' disciples and he denied that he was a disciple of Christ and he started using foul language to prove that he couldn't be one of the disciples. So this same Peter who acted in such a shameless and cowardly manner after being infused with the power of the Holy Spirit stood up in front of thousands of people in the courtyard of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and preached a sermon. Now notice this feast uh, is called Pentecost. Pentecost is a Greek word that means 50 days. This Pentecost was a Jewish feast that happened 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus was crucified and resurrected during the Jewish Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a
covers a seven day period. So Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection happened within the frame of the Jewish Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorates the, the, how the Jews were emancipated from slavery in Egypt. But 50 days later comes the Feast of Pentecost. It's called Pentecost because it happens 50 days after the Jewish Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread. And it commemorates the giving of the law by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. So this was an important feast where most Jews came to worship the Lord at the temple in Jerusalem. Actually, Jews were commanded to make, their, to make every effort to be in Jerusalem at three of their main feasts. Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, which commemorates the giving of the law by God to Moses, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles reminds the Jews that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They had no permanent dwelling place. They lived in tents. So all these Jewish feasts are designed to help the people remember something. So the Feast of Pentecost was a time when Jew, Jewish pilgrims from all the world came to Jerusalem. And if you read Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, you will find that there were Jewish pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem for, from 14 countries. And those Jews had forgotten their native language and had adopted the language of their host countries. Like today, if you meet an American Jew, most probably he doesn't know Hebrew. He speaks English, but he doesn't know Hebrew. He may know some prayers in Hebrew, but he can't speak the language. The same thing happened. The Jews scattered throughout the Mediterranean countries had adopted the language of their host countries and had forgotten their mother tongue. Now the disciples received the gift of the Holy Spirit became bold, they were no longer timid, Peter stood up to preach, but there was a language barrier. Those Jewish pilgrims did no Hebrew, did no Aramaic. So how would, how would the disciples be able to proclaim the gospel message to them? There was a language barrier, and God intervened and solved the problem. If you read Acts chapter 2, you will find that it says all those people who had come from different countries heard the apostles preaching in their own language. Each one heard the apostles' message in their own language. So Peter, when he stood up to preach, he spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. These were the two languages he knew. The Jews who lived in Galilee spoke Aramaic. The Jews who lived in Jerusalem spoke Hebrew. So these are two languages Peter knew, Hebrew and Aramaic. Most probably he preached in Aramaic because he was a Galilean. And those people who had come from 14 different countries could not understand him. But a miracle happened, and it was not a miracle of speech, it was a a miracle of hearing. Those listening to Peter, each one of them heard the Peter's sermon in their own language. It's like at the United Nations. Each country sends an ambassador to the UN, to the United Nations in New York. And each ambassador representing his country <coughs> take, stands behind the podium to give a speech, and he gives the speech in his mother tongue. But the people who don't understand, let's say Chinese, how would they understand what the Chinese ambassador said? Well, they, are e they have earphones at the UN. They have earphones. People put, put on the earphones and choose the language they want to hear, and there's a running translation in 120 languages. So each one can put on the earphones and 
press a button choosing the language they want to hear the translation, uh, in which they want to hear the translation, and they have a running translation. So the Chinese ambassador speaks in Chinese, but everyone hears his speech in his own language. This is exactly what happened at Pentecost. While building a bridge over the East River in New York many decades ago, engineers discovered the hull of a sunken ship. And the, the hull of this sunken ship was at the place where the central piers of the bridge were to be built. So they had a problem. They brought in heavy machinery, but the sunken ship would not budge. Then an engineer got an idea. He said, let, let us let the tide to raise the ship. Let's allow the tide to raise the ship. So when the tide was low, they brought in strong cables, attached them to the hull of the sunken ship. And the other ends of the cables, they fastened to a floating barge when the tide was low. Then when the tide came in, the sunken hull of the ship was gradually raised by the floating barge. So the tide raised the ship. And that's how the Holy Spirit operates. He comes in gently, but gradually lifts us up from the swamps of sin and elevates us to a higher level of spirituality. I said the Feast of Pentecost is as important as Christmas and Easter. When I first made this statement, some people argued with me. They voiced their disagreement. They could not uh, envision the Feast of Pentecost to be as important as Easter and Christmas. But let me tell you why I believe that Pentecost is as important as Easter and Christmas. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Emmanuel, God with us. So in Bethlehem, Jesus came to live with us. Okay, so Bethlehem tells us, or Christmas and Bethlehem tell us, uh, God is with us. Emmanuel means God with us. At Calvary, God died for us. At Pentecost, God dwells in us. And each one of these three events is important. We needed God to dwell for us, to save us, to show us how, he, how God relates. When pe people wanted to know how God relates to sinners, how God forgives people, how God loves everybody. So he sent Jesus and he says, look, if you want to know my character, God says, if you want to know my character, look at Jesus. The way he loves people, I love you. The way he forgives sinners, I forgive. Calvary is important because God died for us, bearing the penalty of our sins. And Pentecost is important because God indwells us through the Holy Spirit. And without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are powerless to do anything. If you feel you are a weak Christian, then this is an indication the Holy Spirit is not living in you, is not operating within you. I read about a man called Bill Fuqua, who was called the motionless man. He was stationed at uh, malls and amusement parks. Usually, he stood on a stage, and there was a sign on the stage saying, make the motionless man laugh, and you win $100. So this fellow 
went to shopping malls, was stationed at shopping malls or amusement park where people gathered. And the temptation was strong. Anyone who made him laugh could win $100. But there was a box there that if you want to try to make the motionless man laugh, you have to put $5 in that box. So you put in $5, but there's a chance that you could win $100. The temptation was very enticing. Thousands of people of all ages, from all classes, tried to make this motionless man laugh. They told every hilarious joke, joke they knew. But nobody, nobody won. Nobody could make this motionless man laugh. He had mastered the art of doing nothing. And unfortunately, there are some Christians who have mastered the art of staying motionless. They won't move, they won't do anything because the Holy Spirit is not within them. So let's remember what Jesus said. When the Holy Spirit is come upon you, you shall receive power. This power is available to all of us. The Holy Spirit is a gift. It's a free gift given to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes in Christ has access to receive this gift. May we utilize this gift. First of all, let's, may we all accept this gift then utilize this gift to the glory of the Lord who died for us.